Okay, here we are with uh, part three on the build demonstration. Um, Alright, you can see here the most important change I'm making is that angle of attack setting on the canards. There's, obviously I've done some stuff up the back as well, um, but that minus 100 angle of attack is going to make the canards try and stay parallel with the airflow as they go. And you'll also may notice that I've pulled pitch down to 25% because I only want about 10 points of pitch deflection, but I want the angle of attack setting to have the full 40 point range to use. So by setting max deflection to 40, but the pitch influence to only 25%, I'm getting that 10% that uh, 10 point um, deflection. And you see here on the analysis, okay, at a decent speed, at 20k, everything's good. Um, if we bring it up to 30, then you'll see we still got a little bit of a stability problem at altitude, but I'm okay with that. This thing ha now has other ways of dealing with that. Um, and with any ship, usually, you will be able to find some speed and some altitude where the numbers go a little crunchy. Um, but it, it's about getting an adequate performance through the range that you need. And I'm showing off the pitch unit here. I get a lot of questions about these. This is what you use to stop the stock SAS wobbling your plane to death. And you see I'm cutting all of the KP values to one third of default and all of the scalars to half default. Alright, what that does, KP is basically the sensitivity, it's how much it wobbles around and how fast it goes back to prograde or the setting or whatever. So reducing that reduces the wobble. Uh, reducing the scalar makes it just stick a bit better. Um, if you want a more technical definition of how all that works, just Go to Wikipedia, look at a PID controller, and there's all sorts of math and stuff about what exactly it's doing. But what it does in practice is it makes the SAS work like it's supposed to. Okay, so you can also see I've made a fair bit of change on the tailplane. Uh, because the your, the your stability problems that we were getting uh, in a lot of cases with the previous design with the two small tail fins, um, there just wasn't enough tail. So. With rockets, the answer is often more boosters. With space planes, the answer is often more tail fin. Um, so, as well as getting the, as well as having the big main tail fin, I've also got a pair of strakes um, out on the uh, lateral tanks, which have got a little bit of dihedral on them, so they also add a little bit of uh, roll stability. Um, up near the front of the plane, either side of the cockpit, you may also notice a pair of verners. Alright, those are mostly for helping to spin it around quickly while I'm VTOLing. Um, but I often put a pair of uh, Verners there even on conventional aircraft. Uh, because they're very good when you're getting into the really high altitudes where your tail fin just stops working as well because the air's too thin. Especially if you need to use a high angle of attack. You see, well, speaking of high angle of attacks, it takes off easy. Um, having that little extra bit of your stability can be very helpful. You'll also see here the effect of the angle of attack settings on the canards. See how they're actually pointing down, even though if you look at the pitch indicator in the bottom left of the screen, you can see I've got the stick hard back. So the aircraft, it, it's doing... What the uh, canards are actually doing is they've got a max deflection of 10 effectively, 25% of 40. So they're 10 degrees above the current airstream. So the current angle of attack. Um, and then if I release the stick, they'll go to exactly matching the angle of attack. But what you're seeing this is letting me do is letting me pull up the nose hard, perfectly smoothly, no stalled or not even the canard to stall it. You see there were no, no, that little stall warning thing just to the right of the nav ball has not been flashing yellow, not been flashing red. And, but at the same time, so I could still pull up quite steeply, and, as you, you know, saw in the takeoff, uh, but I, there was no chance of flipping this out of control. This isn't what you would necessarily want for all aircraft. With a, a stunt plane, a low altitude aerobatics thing, sometimes you want to flip it around and you know, fly backwards for a second. Um, this aircraft can't do that, but this isn't designed for low speed aerobatics. Oh, just looking underneath it, because we're up in time acceleration now, you could see there was a tiny bit of the uh, payload shifting through the cargo bay. That's a thing to watch out for. It's not a problem here. Um, but just as uh, going to time acceleration uh, increases the impact on your wings and things, it also tends to make your cargo flex a bit. Um, so especially if you're using big heavy cargo, turning to time acceleration can make the thing hang 
you know, 9 degrees out of the bottom of your Guardian Bay, shows you haven't strutted enough. That time. And you see here, up to maximum time acceleration. This is a vital part of any um, aircraft test flight because it will reveal problems. If there's any sort of structural weakness, if the fuselage was still flexing like it was before, or if there's a wing that's too weak, or just a little bit of instability somewhere, or an oversensitive control surface, maximum time acceleration is what's going to show it off. Um, but it's also, however, you know, handy to use in practice because it lets you get it over with quickly. So we're already getting up to the altitudes um, where uh, you are getting out of the drag and you can start to seriously build speed, but also not too much higher than this and we're going to start running short of air for the intakes. So I want to get a fair bit of speed up before that happens. So you can see to the right of the nav ball, the intake indicator is starting to go down, 174% you know, on the way down. So I'm pulling the nose down to maximize my speed before I get out of the best air. Like you can fly above these sort of altitudes by throttling down or shutting down engines, but you don't accelerate as quickly then. So I want to get most of my acceleration done while I'm still at an altitude where the engines are all working at full efficiency. So we've got the nose down here to, I'm not going to pull it all the way down to the horizon, I'm going to leave it a little bit above, but still you'll see, if you look at my vertical speed indicator next to the altimeter, up top of the screen, my vertical speed is dropping, and soon I'm going to start actually dropping, you know, entirely. But we're building a lot of speed doing this, the Mark 3.5, and you can see the, you know, inverted commas, re-entry flames, um, starting to show up around the aircraft. That does mean that the drag is increasing. You'll see also the Q value next to the navball is going up as well, 16, you know, 17. Um, and, you know, flames mean friction, Fric friction means drag. But at the moment, I um, don't want to have to pull the nose up because I just want to show you if I can just leave it here. Okay, a port, the pilot has hit the system up. I'm not actually using it, but just for down the bottom with the vertical speed indicator. I'm not touching the controls. That the pitch indicator being up is just the SAS doing its thing. Um, uh, but you can see my vertical speed. It's currently negative, but that number is dropping. I'm going back to level flight. The reason for that is because my speed is increasing, and the required angle of attack required for level flight at any given altitude will decrease as your speed increases, just because there's more, wet hit, more air hitting the wings. Um, so if I just maintain this pitch, maintain this angle of attack, while my speed increases, as you see there, I level out and I start climbing again. And that's the smoothest way to do it, because um, anytime you're using your control surfaces to deflect your direction and you know, start cranking g-forces, there's those g-forces are energy. That's energy that's dissipated. It costs you speed. Um, so just climb smoothly uh, if you want the best speed. There is one addendum to that, however, though. On the final climb, when you're really cranking up for orbital speed, after you shut the engines down, you want to be high enough up that you don't lose all that speed again to drag. So there's a balance between an efficient shallow acceleration and a steep final climb. Um, so we are starting to climb a bit more steeply now. You can see we're up over 100 meters a second and I still haven't touched the controls. This is just the aircraft doing it itself. Um, so as we get a bit higher, we're getting a bit low on the air intake. So I'm going to pull down to zero time acceleration just because uh, a, having a thrust go asymmetric while you're in accelerated time is dangerous. So I've now shut down two of the engines. So we're back in full air again, full efficiency. Will I maximise the altitude before I kick over to rocket mode? Um, an alternate way to do this design would have been only two rapiers with a uh, pair of turbojets in the middle. That would let you run the turbojets a bit longer after the outer rapiers, outer rapiers went on to uh, rocket mode and then you'll get a bit more benefit out of the ram air effect. And it would also sound nice and I, I, I hate the sound effects that go with rapiers, I wish they'd fix them. Turbo jets sound a lot nicer. Um, I'm, I'm a motorcycle, so I like that high wheelie kind of Japanese sports bike sort of sound. Um, uh, but I, I wanted to have excessive amounts of grunt in rocket mode as well um, with this one, so I decided to go with four eight gears instead. But it, with and with the twin centre turbo jets, you would eventually have to shut them down because you would start to get a bit of asymmetric thrust. 
but because they would be nearly on the centre line and surrounded by the high gimbal rocketing rapiers, um, the asymmetric thrust wouldn't be a lot of a, a it wouldn't be a big deal. Um, at most, it would knock you offline a little bit, um, and you'd have plenty of time to react and correct things. Um, you can see again here the canards doing their angle of attack trick. So as we've got this fairly steep, well, yeah, what is that, 15, 20 degrees or so, um, angle of attack, the canards, the way that angle of attack setting works is those hold the nose down and they stop it, they hold it stable where it is, they stop it from going over the top, they act as kind of a circuit breaker for excessive pitch. Um, you can see, as I'm pulling the nose up here, they're getting steeper. I'm testing it, I'm deliberately pushing this to see just how excessive can you go. And there is a limit still. So that, way over the top there, that is not aircraft, uh, airframe design failure, that is deliberate piloting badly sort of thing. But also, look at this. If I just, so we're now flipped out of control, we're high enough up that it's no big deal, but we're flying backwards, so it's causing drag, but as soon as I turn the RCS on, whoosh. Okay, partly because I put those two extra ones on top, I, uh, those are mostly in there for VTOL use, so you can use them to force yourself down against the VTOL engine's thrust, um, but as you see, they also come in very handy in that sort of situation, and just, you know, a second of rocket mode again and we're back up into full orbit. Now we're up and circularized. I just wanted to show off this little probe that's in it here. So you can see it's all you know, very pretty. Um, now this is a my basic little RCS Science Explorer in the recoverable version. So it's got a proper docking port on it and it's got, instead of just having the Vernery, the RCS engines, sorry, the monoprop engines, it also has uh, some of the four-way RCS blocks so it can maneuver a bit more easily. So we'll just pop it out of the cargo bay there it's all nice and easy. These are just single, you know, as uh, short as possible taps on the translation controls. Um, and I'll activate the engines and I'll show you how much Delta V you can get out of this. This is just a, a single 25 unit monoprop tank. Um, so we'll bring up the Delta V thingy. Um, also, with probes, sometimes you can just hit spacebar and stage them and activate all the engines at once. Sometimes that doesn't work and you have to activate them individually. I'm not quite sure what it is that makes the difference between the two. Um, but you can see on the Delta V counter, four kilometers per second worth of Delta V out of a single 25 unit monoprop tank and a thrust to weight ratio of six as well. So this is very fast and can go a very long way um, and can go to pretty much any planet, do some science, come back, be recollected. Um, so it's a very handy thing to have. Uh, especially if you stick one in an explorer craft, as say as the main ship goes in and flies on late, this one could go and hit all the other moons in the system, and, and then meet up with it again on the way out. Um, but the main reason I popped it out here is just to show how crazy and easy it is to dock something that's this lightweight. So I'm using no guides here. I'm just I'm not even bothering to change around to a sensible angle. Uh, I'm just you know roughly eyeballing just trying to get myself back into the cargo bay because I don't actually have to dock as such. All I have to do is get kind of close to the docking port. Anywhere in the bay will do really and woof. Alright, you see that? The magnets so overpower the tiny weight of the probe that it rips itself onto the docking port from any, anywhere. So that's all working well for orbit. That you know, little flip at the end was, like I said, that was a piloting thing, not an aircraft thing. Um, uh, uh, but let's double check to see how if it's still working in uh, VTOL mode and show off a, a bit more proper VTOL flying rather than the cautious experimental stuff I was doing before. Also, uh, I'd like to show you how you do a VTOL landing. So, same as before, takes off easy, flying straight up, get the nose spun around nice and easy with those uh, new verners up front, and hold it down. Okay, I've cut the throttle down, and I'm trying to see if this I can bring it back to just level flight here. And there we go. So fi only climbing five meters a second now. And the other way to stop yourself climbing is to do this. So crank it back up to full throttle again, and let's get some speed on. All right, so we start dropping quickly as soon as we do that. But we're now uh, going forward at, what is that, uh, it's about 10 meters a second or so. Um, which is fast enough for where we're going. Yeah, it's like I said, well, you can see on the nav ball, so the surface speed of 
Oh, hang on, is that 10? No, that's 38, so more than 10. So, yeah, so we're going about 40 metres a second there. Um, and still, the, it does... VTOL flight to me feels a bit faster than it is. Um, okay, so we'll tilt to turn again here, like I did in the last one. And you see that shifted our uh, prograde marker to the right. And, all right, we're still waiting for the engines to spool up properly. So you see here, the little bit of Werner thrust, just enough to get us up over the roof there. So you've got uh, quite fine control. You just need to think ahead a bit and think, am I going to need the main jets, you know, at full blast or not in 10 seconds time when they've actually done what I tell them to? Because um, the Verners are enough to help, but they're not enough to lift the aircraft on its own. Um, so we'll come across here to the uh, launch pad, have a look, and this is how you stop your VTOL. So just crank the nose up. Okay, we were going fast enough that we probably got a bit of lift out of the wings there as well. But also, throwing the thrust jets forward killed all of our all forward velocity. And now we're going backwards, uh, starting to drop a little bit, so best have a look around where we're going. Okay, so crank the engines up again, and again we have to wait for them to spool up, so we use the Verners for a little bit, and how are we going? 40 metres, 35... Yep, 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 33. See, it's like when you buy a new car, you know, you always see the same car on the road all over the place. It's very strange. Um, but anyway, that was just uh, one from a, a previous messing around that I didn't bother to recover. Uh, but, okay, so we'll come down. Engine's back on full, because even though we're going down, they're not going to be back to full throttle before we hit the ground. Um, I'm just using them to, well, back to full thrust. They are full throttle. I'm just using them to soften the landing a bit, which is also why I'm using the Verners. Um, and nearly down, nearly down. Bit of forward tilt to get rid of some of the backwards, and there we go. On the ground, nice and smooth. Um, yeah, so that's all good, I reckon. We're doing well. Dunny, Durden, the old reliable team, the old firm, used them in the first video, I think. You've done well. We've got a good ship here. So, that's it for now. See you around, guys.